In this video, you're gonna learn about a new instructor here at Grayscale Gorilla, and also learn his three favorite features of Cinema 4D R20. Don't miss this one. Hey everybody, it's Nick here from Grayscale Gorilla, bringing you the tools, training, and tutorials to help make you a better motion designer. Now today we're excited to bring to you a new teacher here at Grayscale Gorilla, and his name is Matthew, better known as MASH from 3D Fluff. Now he's been doing Cinema 4D training since 2003, and he's also been using Cinema 4D for over 20 years. In fact, when I was just starting to learn Cinema 4D, his DVDs really opened up what was possible with this new program. So it's really exciting for us to have him here at Grayscale Gorilla, and he's gonna be showing us his three favorite new features in Cinema 4D R20. In fact, he's even helping us with a brand new training package over at Grayscale Gorilla called the Grayscale Gorilla Guide to R20. It's over 11 hours of concentrated training all about the new features in Cinema 4D R20. And it also features all of us here at Grayscale Gorilla and also MASH, who you're about to meet in this video. We're super excited to have this training. A lot of you have asked for some really robust training on all the new features in R20, including fields, volumes, nodes, CAD import, all that stuff's covered. And we're gonna put links here in the video and also down in the description. If you wanna learn more about this robust training, Training, definitely check it out. But first, I wanted to introduce you to one of the teachers of this training, MASH. He's gonna be showing you his three favorite new features in Cinema 4D R20. Take it away, MASH. Hi, I'm Matthew O'Neill. You may know me as MASH from 3D Fluff, or if you're on any of the forums, I usually go by Machination. I've been using Cinema for quite a few years now. I actually worked for Maxon many moons ago, but I've now been freelancing for myself for about the past 15 years. I thought I'd use this uh, introduction video to show you some of my favourite bits of R20. Okay, so one of the first things I want to talk about is Cinema's node system. Uh, but maybe perhaps not quite in the way you're expecting. So version 20 introduced uh, a new Cinema node material. You make a new node material, you open it up, and here we go. We've got lots of nice, lovely nodes. Brilliant. Uh, but it's not really so much the node material itself which uh, excites me. It's actually more what it represents. It's more what this can lead on to. You see, yeah, sure, we've got a node system. And it will help you with your complex materials, piping things in here, piping things out there. But there's a million videos out there which will be showing you how to use Cinema's node system. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make yet another one here. What I want, what I want to briefly talk about is just what this means. So first of all, this means Cinema has a, a brand new fundamental basis on which all materials can now be based. No longer are we sort of stuck with our color channel and our reflectance and our fog. And again, keep in mind, a lot of this stuff is just a bit rubbish and a bit out of date. Nobody really uses the fog channel in a material. Nobody uses all that often the environment channel. Uh, and the glow is, as we've all probably discovered at this point, complete junk. Um, but it's more what this represents. So take a look at the Uber material. The key thing to realize with this Uber material, so it'll look fairly familiar. We'll have sort of our, our color channel, which is now renamed to diffuse, just to be a bit more industry standard. And we've got all our reflection and transparency and such. Cool, nice, lovely. But it's more what it represents. And what it represents is that there is now a much larger team of people capable of making really nice, cool materials. So think of it, think of it this way. For anyone who ever delved into them, do you remember these old Smells Like Holman shaders? These, the, these weird SLA things here. So we're talking Banzi, Banji, Chin, Danel. These were made by some guy, at this point it must be, it must be a good 20 years ago. This was, I think even sort of pre-2000. So there's a programmer and he made a bunch of materials. Well, how many other materials have you seen made since then? What, what material collection has anyone gone off and created themselves? I mean, sure, d different render engines will have a material system, but that, that's more by necessity. Uh, wh what I'm saying is, why have you never seen a great brushed metal material plug-in available for cinema. 
the problem is you've got a very small number of people who are capable of doing the programming to make these sorts of things. What, node repre what nodes represent is the ability for less technically inclined people to now make new materials. Because you need to understand, this uber material here, this is a node-based material. If we jump into the node editor and we, we ungroup this, we, we convert it from uh, an asset, which is basically just something you'll find here, into a group, so we turn it into regular nodes. This arrow here, this lets us jump inside and see what's going on. So this, this Uber material is a node-based material. All the controls, all the gadgets, all the gizmos, they've basically been wired together. And the cool thing for me, which I think is really gonna change things, is that there are hundreds and thousands of people who are technically capable of making good materials with this. Many, 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 many more than you would need to program a whole new set of materials from scratch. So if you look over here, we've got this node materials, and you'll see we've got entries such as car paint, ceramic, gold, granite. You can almost think of these as new versions of these old SLA shaders. These things pretty much never ever got updated because it required one of the specialist material programmers in order to be able to do that, but they're off busy doing other things. These, these are just nodes. So if someone competent comes along and says, hey, this, this marble material, which again, is just a node-based material, all these settings you see here are really just feeding back into these nodes. Someone who's capable could come along and say, hey, I bet I can improve this. I bet I could sort of iterate on this and make a more powerful or an easier to use or a, or a better looking marble shader. Uh, and there we go, that in a nutshell is what sort of really excites me. The fact that you're probably within the next year or so, so where are we now, 2018, uh, we're probably gonna see, I imagine, a whole series of different individuals, different companies, coming out with material collections. So you know you've got this uh, this Grayscale Gorilla Top Coat plugin, for example. Well, that's really just based on top of a standard material. And there's only there's only so far you can really go with this. It's, it's not the best basis for, for making something new. Well, with a new node-based system, I wouldn't be surprised if you started seeing sort of new, even more powerful, even easier to use material systems. So there we go, that, that's one of my sort of uh, my big things. The, the, the potential future of the, of the node system. Now, the next thing which sort of gets me excited is definitely the volume modeling system. Uh, and again, I will say, yes, there is the fundamental factor of what the volume modeling system does, but there is also the potential future here. So let's just sort of split this into two mini bits. Um, first, it excites me because it means all these horrible, annoying subdivision surface modeling techniques we've had to learn over the years, then, well, I'm not gonna say they're no longer needed. Depending on the kind of modeling you're doing, you may still very well need those. But it means that they will be needed far, far less. So let's take a, a, a sort of typical example. Let's say you're modeling up some nice organic shaped TV remote. The amount of time that you would previously have to spend with all these modeling tools, all these cut tools and line tools and everything else, carefully making sure that you've got these edge flows going through your objects and that they're nice and symmetrical and everything else, and that the loops go round and they don't make n-gons, and then you'll you'll throw it inside the subdivision surface and think, oh no, that's that's okay, but it's it's making this weird pinching shape down here because of, uh, because of the way the, the loops flow around the surface. All that hassle, or at least a lot of that hassle, is now just out the window. If I've got to make some sort of organic TV remote, some sort of a handheld ergonomic shape in the future, I'm very, very likely just going to completely ignore the subdivision surface options. What I'm gonna do instead is grab my nice remote control shape. So let's see if I throw a ton of polygons on here. Volumes do benefit from quite high polygon surfaces because you 
wh whatever shape you make, that's what's going to come through in the volume. So any faceting you see, that would actually come through in the final shape. But let's say I've got this nice ergonomic handheld shape here. And I think, right, okay, I need some indentations for buttons, or I need a raised area for a directional pad. Well, it, it just makes life easier. Because I can take this shape here, again, I'll give it some more polygons. Maybe I'll slightly round off the corners just to make it a bit smoother. And then I'll shrink it down. So here's my sort of protruding dial area for my, my new Apple remote. And within there, again, I'm just kind of making this up as we go along. Let's grab a cylinder, shrink it down, pop it over there. But let's say this is one of our buttons. Here's some more. And then we'll just copy and paste, and spin these things around. So let's say this is kind of my, my little D-pad, and maybe just for a little bit of fun, we'll also take one last cylinder, spin it around, throw it over here. We'll just have some sort of a indentation for a finger to sit within or something like that. Well, with the volume system, we can take our volume builder, this is our main body. So we'll just throw all of this stuff inside and say, hey, look, that last cylinder we added, cylinder number four, this one should be getting subtracted. And maybe this ring here as well. Let's let's also subtract this tube. Do, 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 do. Let's subtract from the surface. So yep, the quality is pretty low, but that's just our defaults. Let's pop this down to maybe two centimeters. It's still a bit rough, but we can always come back and uh, tweak this and fix it. That's no worry. And of course, maybe my tube's gone a little bit too far down there. So I'll just have this sort of kind of indentation there. And again, these buttons here, they're supposed to be indentations for the buttons to sit within. So let's also subtract, 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 subtract. Let's remove all of those bits, raise them up a bit, so it's just a small indentation, perhaps. Okay, so here's my nice ergonomic object. I can, of course, now mesh it. Just chuck this builder inside the mesher, and smoothing it off a little bit, we can always just add a bit more resolution to the builder to begin with, so let's knock this down to maybe one centimeter. And to smoothen it all off, oh, there you go, you can see what happens if you don't add enough polygons there, you get that bit of faceting, but don't worry, we can just chuck that in afterwards, that's no biggie. And with our builder, we can just smoothen it. And I do quite like the Laplacian flow because this tends to leave the, the shapes uh, a bit smoother there. Or you can always leave it on Gaussian and just turn down how much it tries to actually smoothen things off. So here, in what, two minutes was this? We've got this nice, lovely, smooth, pretty, pretty high quality, um, organic remote control. How long would this have taken me to do with subdivision surfaces? Um, not only is it quicker to make, but because it, it's an order of magnitude faster, I, I would, compared to me doing this with subdivision surfaces, I would peg this at a good 50 to 100 times faster. It means I'm also free to play with it. If I decide, oh yeah, yeah, you know, all this stuff over here, Oh, it, it's probably too high up. I should have moved it, shuffled it further down. This would be a nightmare with a subdivision surface. But that's fine, it's a lot quicker here. I'll just turn these off for a second. It just makes things easier to select. But I can just go one, two, three, four, five, pop those a bit further down there, turn it back on, give it a moment whilst it calculates, and there we go. I've now got all those adjustments further down the surface. So just from a modeling point of view, this is, it, it, it's great. I, I'm going to absolutely love this modeling feature. But much like the note, it does also represent something else. Now, I'm not predicting the future here. I'm not going to give you any actual insight. I'm just, I'm just going to make an educated guess. Maxon have put the volumes in their own dedicated menu. They're not part of the mesh tools. They're, they've got their very own, their very own volume menu. Now, keep in mind, all of this stuff is based on the uh, the open source, uh, open VDB libraries. So I'm just gonna take a wild guess here. I bet they've popped this in its own menu because at some point, these volume tools won't just be for modeling. 
I bet at some point we will probably get all the fire and the smoke and the general sort of volumetric modeling, uh, volumetric rendering side of things. Now it's not there yet. I've seen nothing of it. This is just purely a guess, but uh, it would explain why it's got its very own volume menu. Because if, if you're gonna make fire and smoke from volumes, you wouldn't wanna put it in the mesh menu because that would imply it's only for modeling. By putting it in its own volume modeling, uh, volume menu, it does sort of open it up for other uses in the future. Now, maybe this is a year or two down the line. Maybe this is five or 10 years down the line. I really don't know, even if it is going to happen. But it does bode well. Let's just put it that way. Now, moving on, uh, my next favorite part is definitely the CAD importers. Now, again, I'm going to try and put a bit of a, a different spin on, on my favorite things here. I'm not just going to pick a feature and then show you, oh, yes, you can do this with it. Uh, I'm sort of going to maybe show you an alternative uh, reason to like it. So Cinema's got pretty good file format support. It's got all the sort of uh, the uh, the Colladas and the FBXs and more recently the Olympic importers. But we can now bring in all well, well, virtually all the biggest CAD formats. So yes, there's the obvious feature here. We can now, of course, just load in these files. I don't know about you, but typically when I'm freelancing and working with other clients, the number of times I've asked for their files and they've sent over some step file or some IGIS file or some other format, which is common in the CAD world, but maybe not so much in the sort of Cinema 4D, Maya, Max, Houdini world. The number of times I've had to sort of phone them back and say, hey, um, that's lovely you've sent me this file, but I can't do anything with it. I don't have AutoCAD. I don't use it. I don't run it. I certainly don't pay for it. Um, could you maybe export this as something else? And if you're lucky, they will. But even then, begrudgingly, you're going to end up with a certain number of polygons. You're going to end up with not enough, or you're going to end up with too many. Um, and you, you're just going to end up annoying them a bit. So the fact that you can now just load all these files straight into the software is absolutely great. But let me give you my different twist. We've got websites we all use for grabbing models. Uh, if you need a good high quality model, you're probably nipping over to say turbosquid.com and you're, you're grabbing whatever file it is you happen to need from here. Um, if you're a bit cheaper, you can nip off to archive3d.net and you can grab various uh, models off of here. But the issue with this is that these things, you know, they're of limited quality. They're, they're, they only have so much, so many polygons and the textures, frankly, very often just don't work. But this CAD importer opens up a whole new series of different resources for us. For example, you've got trace parts and you've got GrabCAD. You can get all sorts of pieces from here. Um, now, even if you're not the kind of person who wants a mechanical electronic coupling or a, a, uh, a water fluid or gas piping electrical hydraulic thing, if you're the kind of person doing perhaps motion graphics, you suddenly have this whole series of really cool mechanical pieces. Maybe you're trying to do some special effects for some sort of Transformers type video where you just want all these mechanical parts swirling in this tornado and then they come together to form some sort of shape. But, well, you now, have, you now suddenly have access to all these pieces all of these parts. I have no idea what a 0 0.50 tiger claw rugged reliable dual wipe socket strip CLP is. Not the faintest idea. But I do know that grabbing some of these items, I think, ah, there's a nice bit of sort of tech gizmo. I mean, I think this is a, I think this is like a, a fan header on a motherboard, maybe? That's what it looks like to me. But we can now just quickly download these things, throw them into Cinema 4D, and play around with MoGraph, stick them on objects. You could make an entire city made of electronic components, maybe, so, sort of cool things like that. 
Um, and so that's trace parts. And then you've got GrabCAD where it's a bit more about sort of large scale objects. So if I search in here for, oh, I don't know, um, some sort of clamp maybe. What do we have clamp wise? We've got these sort of uh, toggle press clamps. Again, I have no idea what these do. I'm not going to pretend I do, but we've got very quite specific bits of equipment. Or let's say you're trying to do some sort of um, engineering uh, motor thing. If I search for an engine, you can get full engine units with all the internal workings and pistons and everything else. These would You could do some great animations with these. You could do some great still images with these. So yeah, it's it's about the world it opens up. That's that that's what I'm getting at with the CAD stuff. Even if nobody ever provides you with the CAD files, it now opens up a whole world of CAD files for you to uh, sort of rummage around and pilfer and use for your own use for your own needs. So finally, I thought I'd just end with one of the longest running little niggles I've ever had with the software. If you have an object, actually I'll tell you what, let's go back to our amazing remote. We'll just make use of this, shall we? Uh, if you have a material, and into that material you load, let's see, some random images there. Let's just nip into my pictures and then into my textures. And what should we load in? Pictures of doors? Why not? Let's load this in. Let's go for some stripes. If you load a texture in, and you throw it on an object, and you choose some sort of projection such as flat, for example. It used to be that when you choose this material texture icon in the corner, you would also have to turn on the axis mode. So you would turn this one on, turn on the axis mode, make your adjustments, and then when you're done, you had to do the same thing in reverse order, turn off the axis mode, then go back to your modeling tool. It was an absolute pain in the derriere. Just because you had to remember to do both icons every time, otherwise you'd either end up ruining the axis of your model, or you'd end up mangling the texture. Well, lo and behold, finally Maxon have listened. When you turn on the texture mode in R20, you no longer have to turn this on. You can simply take your texture, move it around, spin it, move it, rotate it, place it where you like, and that's it. No messing around with the axis tool any longer. We can just place our texture, and there we go, we're done. So yeah, that's gonna save me cumulatively, when you had this up, how many times I've had to click this button, this is probably gonna save me quite a few hours per year just clicking this button. Anyway, there we go. So uh, again, my name is Matthew O'Neill, but uh, most people know me as Mash, and I'll see you around in a Grayscale Gorilla training video. Hey, thanks again, Mash, for showing us those tips. And also, thank you for watching. Now, if you want to learn even more about the possibilities of Cinema 4D R20 and how you can add some of these new tools to your work, definitely check out our new training over at Grayscale Gorilla called Grayscale Gorilla's Guide to R20. We're going to have all the links down in the description and here on the video as well. It's a very robust training package to get you acquainted with all the new features in Cinema 4D R20. Can't wait for you to check it out. And again, thank you again for watching this video. So until next time, thanks again for watching and we'll see you in a video really soon. Bye everybody. Quick question of the day. What's your favorite new feature of Cinema 4D R20? Put it in the comments below.